This video is brought to you by Raycon. Water. Earth. So I've spent the last few weeks going back through Avatar The Last Airbender now that it's streaming again on Netflix. It's always been a kind of comfort food show for me. I loved it as a teenager when it first premiered, and it's a show that I admire all the more now as an adult, for many reasons, but particularly for the way that it was written. Going back through it this time, I found that I was struck by a pair of episodes in a way that I don't think I'd ever been before, and I want to take a minute to dive into each of them. <sighs> Can't you watch where you're- No. The Desert, written by Tim Hedrick from the middle of the second season, follows Team Avatar as they stumble around aimlessly after Appa's capture by a group of sandbenders. And The Beach, written by Katie Matilla from the beginning of the third season, which follows Zuku and company's forced vacation at an island getaway that results in a Breakfast Club-style group therapy session. You want me to express myself? Leave me alone! Neither are particularly big, exciting episodes, but that's precisely the reason why I think I was so struck by them. Because... You don't need these episodes. If you zoom out and look at each of their respective seasons, or the show as a whole, neither of them boasts pretty much anything by way of major plot beats. Take The Desert. There's no real reason why you couldn't cut from the ending of the previous episode, The Library, to the beginning of the following, The Serpent's Pass. Appa's still captured, the group makes it out of the desert, bada bing bada boom, nothing's lost. Same with The Beach. There's nothing really all that vital going on here in regards to the overall plot of the show. By that measure alone, these are nothing more than filler episodes. And yet, I don't think that the show would be the same without either of them. Avatar's not a show that was immune to filler episodes. Who's ready to cross this here canyon? But if the desert and the beach were removed, I think you'd be losing something incredibly invaluable. If you were to classify them, they would almost fit into the mold of what's called a bottle episode. In television's earlier days, these were episodes created as a means of dealing with budgetary concerns. If a studio wanted to spend more money on, say, a show's season finale, they would cut the budget of another episode by reducing the amount of characters included in it, reducing any effects work, and most importantly, by limiting the action of the story to as few sets as possible. It's an enforced limitation, but interestingly enough, it's one that writers and showrunners have turned to their advantage. Seinfeld, for instance, was famous for this. All right, uh, four. <laughs> Seinfeld. Four. I'll be five, ten minutes. The entire 22-minute duration of the early episode The Chinese Restaurant was intentionally set in one spot, as Jerry, George, and Elaine all wait for the table that never seems to be readied. How much longer is it gonna be? about five, ten minutes. <laughs> They're almost like stage pieces. Written and executed correctly, bottle episodes can be a real formally experimental opportunity to dive deep into more complex emotional issues going on with the characters without the heavy lifting of major plot progression. To coin a phrase, it's not filler, it's exploration. <laughs> Going back to Avatar, these two episodes spend their entire runtimes properly digesting a couple of bigger themes. Each story traps the characters in an uncomfortable setting from which they can't escape, and sits with them as they process and grapple with their frustrations. The anger the group feels as a reaction to Appa's capture slips into all-out despair, especially for Aang. We need to focus on getting out of here. What's the difference? We won't survive without Appa. There's a wonderfully pitched moment where Katara has to grit her teeth and push the group further lest they slip any further. Great characters are built on moments like these. Go back to the fundamentals, it all boils down to action, reaction, and motivation. Interestingly enough though, the anger that Zuko feels throughout the beach isn't so much based in his motivation, but rather his lack of motivation. More than any other point throughout the series, this is Zuko at his most lost and confused. His prime motivation up till now was regaining his honor in his father's eyes by capturing the Avatar. But despite the fact that his father has now welcomed him home, there's an overwhelming feeling of waywardness that he can't shake. It may not seem like it, but I'd argue that this is one of the most important episodes in Zuko's overall storyline. It's the key episode between his betrayal of Uncle Iroh in Crossroads of Destiny, and his decision to abandon the Fire Nation in Day of Black Sun. Everything should be perfect, right? I should be happy now, but I'm not. I'm angrier than ever and I don't know why. Now, 
here's what I love. Zuko's story in the beach doesn't really resolve, or at least resolve externally. There's a sense of progression, but it's only just the first steps in the right direction. And it's through admitting to himself something that he's known all along. I'm angry at myself! Why? Because I'm confused. Because I'm not sure I know the difference between right and wrong anymore. The same could be said for Aang in the desert. There's no real finality or closure gained. Like Zuko, the episode ends as he begins coming to grips with what's occurred. His story here is one that begins in rage, but ends in giving up control and accepting the sad and bitter truth of Appa's capture. I don't say any of this because I'm a sucker for downer endings. I think this is brilliant storytelling. A weaker show with weaker writers wouldn't have taken the opportunity to include episodes like these. Episodes designed to just sit with the characters and watch as they process and wrestle. I think this is a huge part of why these characters worked and still work so well and feel so real. Just try to get some sleep. We'll start again in a few hours. And of course, the fact that all of this was done inside of what was ostensibly a show for children, well, that just makes it all the more impressive. Very special thanks to Raycon for sponsoring this video. If you don't know, Raycon's wireless earbuds not only start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds in the market, but they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands you know. Their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best model yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and an overall more compact design that gives you a wonderful fit. On days when I'm animating for hours and hours on end, I pretty much listen to a non-stop stream of podcasts and YouTube videos. And having their wireless earbuds not only eliminates unnecessary wires and cables, but overall helps make my editing process all the more relaxed and enjoyable. And right now they're offering a great deal. You can go to buyraycon.com slash royalocean for 15% off of your order. 